board, and I'm a senior policy analyst at NACIO, and I handle safety workforce issues for NACIO. And today I will be your moderator. During this webinar, we'll hear from the Department of Homeland Security National Cybersecurity Education and Awareness Branch, who will speak on the Scholarship for Service Program. The SSS prepares students to enter the government workforce specializing in cybersecurity and information assurance and is intended to increase the number of cybersecurity professionals in the United States. Uh, before we start, just wanted to go over a few housekeeping reminders. Um, as hopefully you saw in the chat box, all participant lines will be muted during the presentation. Um, when the, uh, pr the uh, presenters ask for questions, you can use the chat box. Um, that's located to the right of your screen. And at any time, if you need to reach our technical moderator, Amy Glasscock, just send her private message via the chat feature. So I'll go ahead now and introduce our speakers. Benjamin Scribner is the Program Director for National Cybersecurity Professionalization and Workforce Development at the Department of Homeland Security. Benjamin is responsible for coordinating and developing national cybersecurity professional development, policy, standards, and assessment requirements to broaden, cultivate, and maintain an unrivaled globally competitive cybersecurity workforce for the nation. Ben leads the National Cybersecurity Workforce Framework and the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies. And each month, they connect to 20,000 users uh, as cybersecurity professional development resources, training, and education. And prior to DHS, Ben worked for the Department of Defense uh, as the CIO Information Assurance Workforce Improvement Program Lead. Uh, Daniel Stein is our other speaker today, and he's the program lead for the National Cybersecurity Education and Training Program at DHS's Cybersecurity Education Awareness Branch. Uh, that program's portfolio includes the nationally focused federal virtual training environment and the Cybersecurity Training Events Program and the Cyber Corps Scholarship for Service Program. Uh, Dan has supported DHS's interest in cybersecurity education and training for eight years and has also been, an act, been active in the federal government information security efforts for the past 11 years. Uh, ben and Dan, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Meredith. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm just going to uh, start out by talking a little bit about uh, what we do here at uh, the National Cybersecurity Training and Education Program as it relates to NACIO. Um, at, uh, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Ben, who's going to tell you more about uh, National Cybersecurity Workforce Structure uh, efforts. And then we'll take questions at the end. So I think if I've got control, I can move. Good. And we should be all set. So let's start with the National Centers of Academic Excellence, or uh, the CAE program. DHS uh, co-leads this with the National Security Agency, or NSA. This is a program that designates the top schools or the top colleges and universities uh, across the country as national centers of academic excellence in cyber defense. We are, uh, well, we have been involved in this program since 2004, uh, shortly after the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. And uh, we do so because we want to ensure that our, our nation's uh, colleges and universities are not only uh, offering cybersecurity curricula that meets high standards, but to ensure that their graduates are graduating with the knowledge that uh, employers are looking for and the skills that employers are looking for. The National Centers of Academic Excellence uh, assigns a set of knowledge units that schools must map their curricula to in order to be considered for designation. Those knowledge units come in the form of core knowledge units that every school that uh, wishes to be a CAE must meet, and optional knowledge units. And the school has the ability to choose from a set of optional knowledge units uh, to which they must map. Schools can also decide that they're going to apply for certification in a particular area of cybersecurity that's mapped to the framework that Ben is going to be talking about uh, in a little bit. And uh, that works for a few different reasons. One is uh, it helps the government and uh, employers across the country choose the, uh, the candidates who they want to see because they're looking for a particular uh, set of expertise. So they can go to a school, that if they're looking for someone, say, 
uh, who specializes in digital forensics, they can go to a school that specializes in digital forensics. By the same token, the schools have an easier time recruiting students because it means that a student who is, say, based across the country might not otherwise consider a particular school because uh, they want to go to school closer to where they live. But instead, they're going to choose to travel to get to a school because uh, that school specializes in the area in which they're interested. And uh, third, it really is a benefit to the country as a whole because it helps us identify uh, which schools are um, focusing in the areas of critical need to the country. And if we do not have schools that are specializing in those areas, it provides a very easy gap assessment for us. Students uh, who go to these schools all uh, can feel confident that the degrees that they're getting are preparing them to enter the workforce upon graduation. And every employer that recruits from the CAE program can feel confident in the quality of students that they're getting. Moving on to the next slide, the Scholarship for Service Program. One of the great benefits of being designated as a National Center of Academic Excellence is the ability to apply for an SFS award. SFS is a grant that the, uh, the National Science Foundation administers and issues to select colleges and universities. It's up to those recipient colleges and universities to distribute that grant or distribute that scholarship to the students who are uh, specializing or who are studying cybersecurity. And in exchange, using the model of a Reserve Officer Training Corps, that student, upon graduation, must work in the government for a period of time equivalent to the length of their scholarship. So just like in ROTC, a student who receives their scholarship for two years owes the government a period of service uh, of two years. When I say the government, I'm talking not only about the federal government. I'm talking about federal, state, local, and tribal government. Moving on. We've had tremendous success in placing candidates from the Scholarship for Service program. Since the creation of the program in uh, at the beginning of uh, 2001, the government has placed uh, approximately 93% of scholarship for service students. And that number is actually higher in the more recent years as many other, well, many um, uh, agencies within the federal government as well as uh, state, local, and tribal governments are warming up to the idea that they have to create positions for cybersecurity because uh, in the past, it was sort of catch as catch can. You, you may have a position available in cybersecurity, otherwise we'll take your resume and we'll see. Now we have specific positions and many of them that are fenced off for cybersecurity professionals. So a lot of the scholarship for service graduates are finding it much easier than in past years to find a job upon graduation specifically in cybersecurity. There are currently over 500 students who are in uh, the scholarship or who are receiving uh, SFS awards. And I'm very pleased to say that in our last two uh, job fairs, we have a virtual job fair and an in-person job fair. In both of those job fairs, we have the participation of state government as well as local government. In the slide that's, uh, that's on your screen right now, Every state that's in blue has at least one scholarship for service school. I'm going to add that uh, Puerto Rico now has uh, an SFS school within it. Otherwise, I'll, I'll just uh, move on. But uh, uh, when you have a copy of the slides, you'll see the, uh, the states that have at least one SFS school. And this is a list of SFS participating institutions. If you are interested in hiring an SFS student, you can do so through uh, a few different ways. One is that you can go to uh, the Scholarship for Service website. Uh, the link is, is going to come up in the next slide. But you can first write to sfs at opm.gov. Um, when you go to the Scholarship for Service website, you would register as an agency. And uh, upon doing so, you would have access to the resumes of the Scholarship for Service students. It would also enable you to participate in job fairs uh, in the future. 
I mentioned there are two job fairs. The virtual job fair is in the fall. Uh, the reason for that is that some of the agencies that are looking for interns uh, have very strict security requirements and they have to start the security processing very early. So in order to start an intern in the summer, they would need to start their processing in the fall in order to ensure that someone who is going to get cleared will be cleared by the time the summer rolls around. For everyone else, they can recruit interns uh, at the in-person job fair, which is in January. And uh, it, so far, uh, every year, it has been in January in the Washington, D.C. area. The website that I mentioned is uh, the first line. Uh, visit the uh, SFS program site um, at uh, sfs.opn.gov. And uh, just to restate the email address uh, to send in inquiries is, scholarship, is sfs at opm.gov. Uh, you can also feel free if you see any schools in that list that are within your state or even nearby, uh, feel free to reach out to them directly. Uh, you can also, if, once you register as a hiring agency, you can contact the students directly because you would get access to their, uh, their resumes. And finally, as I've already mentioned, uh, you can attend our either virtual job fair or uh, the in-person job fair, or possibly even both. Moving on, the, uh, the Department of Homeland Security also offers cybersecurity training, not uh, formal education programs, especially to IT professionals in the government. This started out as a program for federal government employees, but within the year, we have extended the use of the Federal Virtual Training Environment, or FIDBTE, to state, local, tribal, and territorial government, uh, as well as to U.S. veterans. FIDBTE is online on demand. Uh, we have a set of cybersecurity training courses that are available whenever you'd like. You simply go to the site and you register uh, to, for, uh, to uh, open an account. You would need to either uh, use your .gov or .mil email address. And if you do not have one, then the uh, Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center is our partner to vet those uh, state, local, tribal, and territorial government employees who do not have .gov or .mil email accounts. If you, have, uh, if you encounter any trouble, we have a help desk, but uh, hopefully the, uh, the, I think the, the system is fairly uh, self-explanatory, but uh, if you do have any issues, you can certainly reach out to the help desk and, uh, and they can answer any questions you have. There is no cost. The Department of Homeland Security offers FedVTE to uh, government employees, as I mentioned, at no cost to them. This is uh, in part to save you money. Uh, it's also in a way to save the United States money because we've calculated the average cost per year for your training. And at least in 2014, we're still working on uh, data for 2015, but in 2014, we have an estimate that the country spends, or the, the government spends, approximately $72 million in training when you include tuition, uh, books, um, various materials, and travel. The program costs us approximately $1 million. So uh, that's residual savings to the country of about $71 million a year. We offer a range of courses on SEDBTE, and these courses are, uh, we say beginner to expert. Um, even the beginner courses generally assume some background in uh, technology, but uh, they're they're fairly basic cybersecurity courses, not for the layman, but for the IT professional, as well as for uh, the expert cybersecurity professional who's looking to hone their skills. We also have uh, courses that, been, that uh, prepare you for certain certifications, including Network Plus, Security Plus, uh, Certified Information Systems Security Professional, CISSP, which is uh, probably the most popular certification on the market today and Certified Ethical Hacker. And uh, I, before moving on, I want everyone to note that the, uh, the website that is on the slide right now is the website you go to in order to 
form in order to, uh, to register for an account on FedVT. You'll note that this is on the NICS portal, NICCS, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies, and Ben will be saying a little bit more about this portal later on. Online registration, that's uh, the landing page once you go to that site. If you don't wish to go to NICS, and you know, you, there's certainly nothing to be lost by going to NICS, but the direct link is fedbte.usalearning.gov. And the last thing I wanted to cover is that we have a, um, we call it FedVTE Live. Um, it's really a real-time component to FedVTE. Whereas FedVTE includes recorded training, where you go to a course and you see a, uh, a lecture capture, where there's a lecturer in front of a class, and there's a video of that lecturer and a transcript of what the lecturer says, and the PowerPoint that the lecturer is using, FedVTE Live offers cybersecurity courses in real time where you're using your virtual network and uh, you create an avatar that may or may not look like you. You stand in a lecture hall with other students and you can interact one-on-one -on -one with the lecturer. There are breaks in which all the students will go to breakout rooms and they'll work on assignments. There are virtual machines with virtual labs, and you can complete assignments and even interact with the instructor while you're working on those assignments, and then you would return to the lecture hall. We also offer, through FedVTE Live, a series, uh, or a single course, but offered uh, throughout the year, called uh, the Federal Executive Cybersecurity Seminar, which is in person. Uh, when, it, well, when it's in person, it's usually in the Washington, D.C. area, and because of that, we generally expect that the executives who are going to be there are in the federal government. But we do make it available to state, local, tribal, and territorial government representatives and uh, specifically executives. If you cannot make it to Washington, D.C., we will offer the Federal Executive Cybersecurity Seminar uh, through that same virtual platform that I was mentioning. You can learn more about our FedVTE Live courses if you go to the uh, the webpage, once again, that's uh, through NICS, uh, the nics.uscert.gov slash training, and uh, then go to FedCTE. Um, I'll tell you that FedCTE is the old name of the, of the FedVTE Live program. Um, hope that doesn't throw anyone. Uh, we just need to update that, uh, that link. So with that, I will move it uh, along so that uh, Ben can tell you about the cybersecurity workforce. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, so I am going to talk about a few other programs that, that you can tap into and, and make use of in addition to the great programs that Dan just talked about. <clears throat> and, uh, but, but, but before I do that, I really wanted to try and set the stage by talking a little bit about the challenges that, that inspired the creation of a lot of these programs. And so I think it won't come as any surprise to anybody who's on this call that as technology increasingly becomes more sophisticated, the demand for experienced and qualified workforce to protect our nation's networks and information systems has never been higher than it is today. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have seen the articles from the last few months from the likes of Forbes and Burning Glass, Symantec, most of them quoting Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics data and, and showing that we have hundreds of thousands of unfilled cybersecurity positions. Uh, the, the job postings in cybersecurity have been increasing four times as fast as, uh, as, as the, the information technology position postings, which shows an, an incredible uh, acceleration in our demand for cybersecurity professionals. And, uh, and, and that's, that's only for information technology. In fact, the, the demand for cybersecurity has also been in, outstripping the, the demand for jobs in general by closer to 12 times the national average. And, and these, um, these projections uh, of uh, an ever-increasing number of positions 
and uh, unfilled positions really points towards, in the next three to four years, a shortfall of between you know, 1.5 to 2 million cybersecurity positions. Uh, and, and so that's a, that's a really huge hurdle. And the bottom line really is that employers are having a hard time getting and keeping the cybersecurity, the qualified cybersecurity professionals that they need to achieve their mission. And so there are many factors that play into this. You, you know, we certainly have an escalating threat landscape. We are also just becoming aware of the problem with all of the, the high profile uh, incidents that are in the media. The, the C-suite and, and every uh, leader in every organization is acutely aware, uh, all the way up to the highest levels of government, of, of the threat and the concerns and, and desperately trying to shore up their cybersecurity workforce to, to address those challenges. But there's also a, a more systemic problem that underlies all of this, this chaos that we're dealing with. And that's really that there has been no single framework for creating cybersecurity positions, career pathways, and workforce development programs in cybersecurity. It, it, there has not been a single standard for every organization to follow. And, and for that reason, we really have an environment in which the, there are no portable skills for employees between jobs and between organizations. When an employer creates a job posting and, and makes it available out on the market and you, you receive applications, it is very hard to find somebody who has really strongly applicable experience in the same kind of job because every job is created effectively from whole cloth. It's, it's a brand new job in almost every sense of the word because there hasn't been a standard established for creating those jobs. And, and as a result, because every job is different and you have an inability to easily find people who have matching skills and credentials and experience, especially experience, it becomes really in, inefficient to recruit and onboard people into cybersecurity positions. It takes months to find the right person. Uh, if you, and oftentimes we end up compromising and spending an enormous amount of time and resources retraining people to do the specific job that you're hiring for. In fact, the numbers that I, I have seen are somewhere in the order of 12 to 18 months to really bring somebody on and get them fully up to speed and Really, the, the numbers for, over, for turnover in the, the highest demand positions is actually quite equivalent, somewhere in the order of 12 to 18 months. So just as you've finally gotten somebody up to speed and is really proficient in these high demand areas of cybersecurity, you're losing that person to a better offer. And then really, this all becomes a, a problem not just for the employers, um, but also for the educational community who is trying to groom people for these positions. Obviously, they have a hard time uh, and oftentimes create generalists for those people who are looking for entry-level positions because it's hard to craft skills for a particular job when there aren't any clear standards for jobs. And also, importantly, for the cybersecurity professionals themselves because without a clear standard to follow for creating cybersecurity positions, career paths, and workforce development programs, you have a really hard time creating career opportunities that are compelling for people to stay within your organization. That leads to higher turnover. And you also have a disincentive for people to join the cybersecurity workforce in the first place, which reduces the, the pipeline of people in order to, to fill the positions. So what does this lead us to? Um, the, uh, the next slide that I'll, I'll bring up um, shows some of the things that we are, we're trying to build in the cybersecurity job market, just for, not just for Homeland Security or the federal government or even just for government as a whole. It's really for the entire nation. Um, what we did is we actually brought together at Homeland Security, we brought together subject matter experts from cybersecurity organizations 
not just within the federal government, but across the private sector. We, we had uh, subject matter experts from a, a wide variety of private organizations from as diverse backgrounds as PricewaterhouseCoopers, John Deere Tractor, Discover Card. We also had uh, subject matter experts from academia and, of course, from the federal government, both on the military and civilian side. And we had those people come together and build out what we call the National Cybersecurity Workforce Framework, which is an identification and, and uh, lexicon and taxonomy of all the tasks that cybersecurity professionals perform. And we had them also connect with each one of those tasks, the knowledge, skills, and abilities to perform those tasks, and we had them group those into specialty areas and categories. And what that really gives us for the very first time is that framework, that standard for creating cybersecurity positions, career paths, and programs. And what it gives us also is a foundation for creating a larger and more capable cybersecurity workforce. The, these benefits listed on the slide are really all the same benefits that we're, the, the, that we're trying to create in the job market, this ability for there to be portable skills so that when people have a job, that, those, that job experience is applicable beyond their current post, maybe to other positions as they advance through their career within their organization or other positions within other organizations as they move between organizations, making it much faster and easier for, for employers to hire and recruit and retain the right people in an efficient manner, manner, and also to create career paths that are compelling to cybersecurity professionals, both in terms of joining their organization and also staying, which is the key in order to get both recruitment and retention in an efficient manner. Uh, this is the National Cybersecurity Workforce Framework from the category standpoint. You can see that there are the seven different categories in cybersecurity. Within each one of those seven categories, there are 30 different specialty areas. And within each one of those specialty areas, again, are all the different tasks that cybersecurity professionals perform. At this juncture, over 85% of the federal government has already mapped all of their cybersecurity positions to this workforce framework. So it has already been implemented virtually government-wide in the federal government. Uh, furthermore, the Cybersecurity Act of 2015 requires the federal government to code all federal positions to the workforce framework. And we're seeing now an uptake in state and local government as well. We have California, which has already developed a plan to map state positions to the workforce framework. Uh, and to, to structure their workforce based on the framework using the, this structure. And, uh, and we were also working with, directly with six or seven other states here at Homeland Security. We've reached out to those different state or, uh, organizations and are working with them to try and help them to, to follow suit and do, do a very similar, make a similar move to mapping their positions and leveraging the workforce framework to help them with their workforce development programs. Uh, several different industries have also started to embrace the workforce framework. You have financial services industry has already started to develop the capability to, to use the workforce framework to connect the educational community that, that provides cybersecurity professionals to their positions with the jobs at the employers. Uh, we also have uh, the healthcare industry uh, studying the workforce framework and, and looking for ways to leverage it to help out the healthcare industry as well. And so it's not, it's not stopping there. There's, there's quite a bit of work that's being done in these different organizations. And in order to help out organizations, and this is the point at which we start to talk about programs and resources, to help out organizations, and I'm not just talking about, again, federal organizations, but state and local organizations that are that hire cybersecurity professionals. Anybody, all of you who are on the phone who, who have cybersecurity teams who work for you, uh, and, and really a lot of your constituents as well, the, 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 uh, the um, private sector organizations within your states, we have provided tools and resources to try and help you to use the workforce framework for your own benefit. 
DHS, as you can tell from both Dan's presentation and mine, sponsors and supports a variety of different programs aimed at educating and training the nation's current and future cybersecurity workforce. What you see on the, on, on the slide here is the Workforce Development Toolkit, which really is keyed to the well-established workforce development life, life cycle. It provides the, a, a lot of um, templates and tools, guidelines, best practices, and a number of other different resources that will help an employer, both in terms of the human resources department and from the employer's tech, uh, IT or cybersecurity office to build out cybersecurity teams that will meet your organization's needs. And it's not, one thing that it is not is a replacement for uh, your human resources uh, education. This, this is not a toolkit that teaches human resources how to do their job, but what it really does is provide you with information and tools to help you and your human resources department navigate the unique challenges in cybersecurity workforce management and development. Because cybersecurity is unique in some ways, and there are some ways to approach that in best practices that have already been, that are already being developed, and this toolkit captures many of those. We have a lot of other tools and resources on the next portal that, that Dan has mentioned. The URL is there at the bottom of this slide. And if you go there, you can find this toolkit. You can find the tools and resources that Dan talked about, uh, including the Federal Virtual Training Environment, uh, Centers for Academic Excellence, Scholarship for Service, uh, we also have the training catalog, which Dan mentioned, which is one way to access the federal virtual training environment, but also includes a whole host of training resources that are outside the federal government as well. We have private sector training listed in the catalog, and it's really a catalog of, of as many different courses uh, that, are, that are available that, uh, that have already mapped their curriculum to the workforce framework. And in this way, it makes it easier to find the training and curriculum that you need in a more efficient manner once your, your positions are also keyed to the workforce framework. Uh, and finally, I would just say that uh, the NICS portal itself is a great resource for just learning about the framework. We have guides for employers to help employers learn about the workforce framework, and we have an interactive workforce framework online available for you to, to use. If you have any questions about uh, anything that we discussed today, here is the contact information for both Dan and I. And uh, we would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Dan and Ben, thanks so much. Uh, just wanted to give uh, participants a little bit of background information about NASIO and State IT Workforce. Uh, and, and why this is so important to our members. Uh, last year, for the first time uh, in a long time, um, state IT workforce was an issue on NASIO's top 10 list that we publish every single year. Um, and, and also, uh, we've heard that security is the skill that presents the greatest challenge uh, for our state IT, uh, for our CIOs. Uh, so we really began to look at this issue again. We had looked at it several years um, before and just trying to drill down on uh, what the issues are, what we can uh, do to kind of um, move that along. And so this fits in uh, perfectly, and I'm glad you guys were able to talk to us today. So just wanted to share a couple of statistics that we've found uh, in the research that we've done. And you all touched on this. Uh, for the federal government, it's an issue, and obviously, as you said, for state and local governments, 92% uh, of states say salary rates and pay grade structures present a challenge in attracting and retaining IT talent. And 86% of states are having difficulty recruiting new employees to fill IT positions. So nothing new, uh, again, goes along with what uh, you all have talked about. And we also found, by the way, when you're talking about cybersecurity, uh, which presents the greatest challenge in hiring for state uh, CIOs, um, the state CISO tenure is about 20 uh, is about 25 months. Um, 
I'm sorry, it's about 39 months as compared to about 25 for state CIOs. So a lot of the times we have issues, we get great um, CISOs in and then they, uh, you know, get offers from the, from the private sector. Um, so this is very important to our uh, members. So anyway, just wanted to share a couple of those stats. And then uh, I have a few questions and then just a reminder, um, if participants have other questions to use the chat box to the right of your screen. Um, so just wanted to go back a little bit and talk about scholarship for service. Um, and I know you mentioned that there were several institutions all over the country that had that participated in scholarship for service. But if our participants don't see a local uh, college or university on that list, how can they encourage uh, a local institution to join? What's that process like? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, the first thing they should do is refer to the schools that already have a National Centers of Academic Excellence designation. I mentioned that uh, one of the benefits of being a CAE institution is the ability to apply for SSS awards. The, uh, the fact that a school may or may not have a CAE designation does not necessarily mean that they uh, will get uh, an SFS award, uh, nor does it mean that you must have a CAE designation in order to get an SFS award. Uh, as of right now, of the schools that do receive SFS awards, only one is not a CAE, which uh, should demonstrate the power that comes along with uh, having that designation. But to answer the question specifically, if, say, uh, an individual lives in uh, Nevada, which uh, to my memory does not have a, uh, an SFS institution in it, they could go to um, a school that has CAE designation. Uh, they could go to a school offering cybersecurity as uh, an academic discipline and ask if they have considered applying for CAE designation because one of the benefits is, um, is the SFS award or the potential to, uh, to get an SFS award in order to uh, have those students get scholarships and then work in the government uh, upon graduation. But really, uh, you don't really necessarily have to go that route to, uh, to encourage local schools to become CAEs and with that uh, to go for the, uh, the Scholarship for Service Award. It's just as easy to reach out to any school across the country, contact the principal investigator of the SFS award. Uh, every SFS recipient school has a principal investigator. They're a professor and uh, they know the most about the program, their cybersecurity program on their campus. And uh, you can speak about the, uh, the quality of student or graduate you're looking for for your organization and to see if potentially there's a match there. That's great. Thanks so much. And uh, kind of following up on uh, kind of the other side, the student aspect, uh, this question comes from our resident NACIO millennial, Olivia Hook, who's sitting next to me. Um, you mentioned uh, about virtual job fairs to attract students for SFS, but um, is there anything to kind of elaborate on uh, just a bit on promoting the program to qualified students? Maybe Olivia is interested. Uh, <laughs> she's sitting right here. But if there's anything, uh, any other information on that? So the question was about how to promote the scholarship for service to students? Right, to qualified students. I saw that you had virtual job fairs and things like that, but is there any other information on that? Sure. Uh, right now, the scholarship is set up so that uh, if you're going to receive it for two years, it would be the last two years of education. So one thing that uh, the NICS portal does, for example, since uh, Ben mentioned uh, the NICS portal, is that we advertise all of the scholarship uh, opportunities that DHS is involved in, uh, including the scholarship for service. So we, uh, we do make sure, at least through uh, DHS's mechanisms, that students are aware of the SFS program. Once they're in school, then uh, they should be aware of which schools are CAEs, and if they're going to a CAE, which of those CAEs receive the, uh, the SFS award. If they are in a school that receives the SFS award, they should do exactly the same thing as uh, I mentioned uh, with regard to what the, uh, the, me the members of, uh, of NASIO should do, which is contact the principal investigator. That person can tell them what the criteria are, and uh, a lot of these criteria are actually set by the school themselves. 
in as much as uh, this student feels that uh, they would be a good candidate. Um, and they uh, are not only studying cybersecurity, but they're uh, actively pursuing a cybersecurity career field in the government. Um, there are all sorts of opportunities to do so, and they can start now by looking to see which schools are uh, receiving SFS awards. If I could just pile on there, this is Ben Scribner. You know, the NICS portal, as Dan said, is a great resource for information about all these things. So regardless, if you're, you're speaking to a school that might be interested in becoming a center of academic excellence or, or offering the scholarship for service scholarship, uh, if you're talking to students who might be interested in becoming scholarship for stu service students, you can find all this information about the, the scholarship for service and the centers for academic excellence on the NICS portal. And, uh, and we have oftentimes with this information, contact us information and that allows you to reach out to the, to the, the uh, teams that run these programs directly, or you can also, in any program that's featured on the NICS portal, go down to the, NIC, to the contact us link at the bottom of the NICS portal. We have a whole team of people who are there to answer questions about the programs that we run and that we co-sponsor. And if we don't have an answer to your question, we, can, we are very well connected across the federal government, can usually connect you with those who do. So really, the, the NICS portal, uh, at the URL that I had previously shown, and I, I can uh, we can navigate back to the slide where the with the uh, URL, if you like, can uh, can be a great resource for finding all that kind of information. Thanks, Ben and Dan. We have a question that came in on the chat box, chat box, and this is from Mark Little. Um, and Mark says, currently, are all the scholarship dollars being utilized, or are there a shortage uh, of applicants? And I just to uh, tag on to that as you're answering that, is there a cap on the amount of funding uh, overall as well? The funding that is available for the Scholarship for Service goes directly through uh, the annual appropriations process to the National Science Foundation. By law, the National Science Foundation administers the Scholarship for Service. So it's, uh, it will depend on the amount of money that Congress appropriates to the National Science Foundation from year to year. At this time, there is no shortage of students who are interested in the award. There are no schools that receive the award that have a surplus of money. Uh, there is no surplus in the National Science Foundation as far as giving to schools. So there. Uh, there is certainly no shortage uh, on the part of applicant schools or applicants within the school. So is there a cap on individual scholarships, you know, for say, we're here in Lexington, Kentucky, you know, and our scholarship might cost less than, let's say, if you're at, you know, Columbia University in, in New York. Is there a difference there or a cap? It will be dependent on the tuition at that particular school. So uh, when the principal investigator says that um, I, I need this much for, uh, for my scholarship, he will take into account whether or not uh, the tuition at that particular school is high or low uh, and factor that in. If we're talking about a private school like, for example, Carnegie Mellon, tuition is going to be higher than at uh, a state school like Kentucky. There is no there is no cap set in policy. It's dependent on the needs of, of the student who's going there. Um, so if the student is going to a less expensive school, their scholarship will cover the tuition, room and board fees, uh, professional development. It's, uh, it's a very generous scholarship, and no, there is no cap. Wow, that, that is generous. Um, we have a couple of questions here about typical programs that you pull from uh, for the for SFS, uh, cybersecurity, engineering. What are some typical programs? There, well, it's it, it is specific to cybersecurity, but the programs that administer the award are not only. Uh, something where they're not only academic programs with the name cybersecurity. The degrees that 
uh, the students that are studying cybersecurity receive are frequently uh, like a, a bachelor or master's of science in uh, engineering or in uh, computer science or sometimes in business. We, we even have a person on staff here who is a scholarship for service student who got her uh, MBA. And it's just that uh, in that particular MBA program, there was a focus on cybersecurity. And they wrote their application such that uh, since they were already a National Center of Academic Excellence in cyber defense, the program is rigorous enough in cybersecurity education that their MBA students who had a, a cybersecurity track could qualify upon graduation and enter the cybersecurity workforce. So there are no, I think to, to answer the question as best I can, there is no set uh, name of the academic programs, but uh, certainly there must be a cybersecurity track within those programs. Thank you. The next question comes from Patricia Jansen, and she says, she asks, besides the state of California, are there other states that DHS is working with to map state positions to the National Cybersecurity Workforce Framework? Yes, yes. In fact, there are, as if I, uh, at last count, I think six different uh, states that we have reached out to and are trying to work with directly. Um, you know, we, we have engaged with uh, people within the state of Florida, New Jersey, Virgin, uh, we're, we're, lo we're looking at engaging with Virginia and Maryland. Um, we've talked to people in, in Michigan. Uh, th there's a wide range of different states that have either come to us or we have gone to them and, uh, and reached out to them. And so if you are from one of those states or not one of the states that I, I just rattled off, regardless, we are interested in working with you. In fact, <clears throat> um, we are in the process of developing out our, uh, our, our team of subject matter experts to be able to engage directly with, again, like the HR organizations or the, the IT or cyber organizations within each uh, employer and help them with their tough cybersecurity workforce development challenges. Uh, and those teams, we will, we will be piloting this kind of engagement capability with a few different organizations over the next year. So if you're interested in, in, uh, in working with us, uh, you, can, you can reach out to us. The best way is through that Contact Us link at the bottom of the NICS portal web pages. Um, just go to the URL, go down to the bottom, click Contact Us, and let us know that you're, you are, would be interested in, in talking with us uh, about some of the challenges that your organization faces, and we'd be happy to try and help you. Obviously, we work discreetly, um, and, uh, and the... Uh, but it's important to note that this is not something that we, uh, you have to have a challenge or a problem to address to be engaged with this. Really, developing out your cybersecurity workforce, you know, uh, many of these states have already, uh, even the ones that I just mentioned, are, are, are actually have very robust cybersecurity workforce across the state. Um, but what they are trying to do is get ahead of the curve of uh, organizations that are, are using the workforce framework so that they can benefit from the considerable uh, efficiencies that are created when the employer and the educational community use the workforce framework to create that efficiency in hiring, the efficiency and, and, uh, and effectiveness in retention programs and, and um, in developing career paths. So uh, please feel free to contact us and let us know if you'd be interested just to hear about more about the workforce framework or any of the, thing, the tools and resources that we have, um, and we would be happy to work with you. Great. Thanks, Ben. And last question, I uh, wanted to, a question that came in via the chat box about the federal virtual training environment. I believe you said that that state and local employees can use it as well as long as they have a .gov email address. Did I hear that correctly, or, or what's the correct answer there? Uh, you heard that correctly, but uh, I'll go a step further as to say that uh, even if you did not have a .gov or .mil email address, 
uh, state, local, tribal, and territorial government employees can still gain access to uh, the training on FedBTE. Uh, they just have to pass through a vetting process that our partner, the Multi-State uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center, runs. So uh, you would go to uh, the site, you would register for an account, and you'll be told if you don't have these credentials, then um, you know, if, if you are a uh, state, local, tribal, territorial government employee, click here, and you, uh, you would enter the information that it asks, um, and then that would go to MSISAC. MSISAC would uh, probably contact you to get a little bit more information, but uh, assuming that you are, in fact, who you say you are, then if you are a state, local, tribal, or territorial government employee, you would have no trouble gaining uh, access to FedBT. Thank you so much, uh, Ben and Dan. This has been such a, a wonderful webinar. We had some great questions, some great information. Um, and just want to reiterate to all participants, we will uh, put up the webinar on our website and share the presentation via the NACIO community. Um, and anyone can feel free to email me. I think we've put up my picture now so everyone can see who's talking to you through the screen. Um, and so if you want uh, additional information on any of the resources that we talked about, I'm happy to uh, help out. Uh, NACIO.org forward slash workforce also has a lot of uh, resources on there as well. Um, so again, thank you to our wonderful speakers and to all of our participants uh, for uh, joining us today. Uh, stay tuned. We'll have other NACIO workforce uh, events in the future. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. The host has left the meeting.